Welcome to 20 Minute Health Talk. I'm your host, Rob Hoyle. Today's show is all about the power of medical research. There's perhaps no better example recently than the COVID-19 vaccines, and our guests today played an instrumental role in developing the mRNA technology that made them possible. There are so many ideas uh, related to what the mRNA would be useful, and those uh, I collected for 24 years. It is the time to go on those lists and try to see that what will be successful. That was Dr. Caitlin Carrico at an event honoring the game-changing breakthroughs in mRNA that she and her research partner, Dr. Drew Weissman, accomplished together at the University of Pennsylvania. For their contributions to medical research, the history-making duo were awarded with the 2022 Ross Prize in Molecular Medicine, an annual award meant to cultivate promising careers in the fields of science and research. Later in the show, we speak with Dr. Kevin Tracy, president of the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research, about the importance of prizes like this for mid-level scientists. But first, we bring you our conversation with Drs. Weissman and Carrico during the 2022 Ross Prize Award Ceremony at the New York Academy of Sciences in Manhattan. Thank you so much for joining us here on 20 Minute Health Talk. Dr. Carrico and Weissman, your pursuit of mRNA technology has spanned two decades and led to vaccines that continue to save lives and protect countless more from COVID-19. We'll get to that more in a minute, but first let's talk about this award. Let's start with Dr. Carrico. What does it mean for you to receive this Ross Prize? Um, I am deeply honored to receive a prize. And whenever I get a prize, I always feel that I accepting in the name of all of the scientists who work before us and together with us, because, uh, you know, the science is a team sport. <laughs> Everybody had to pinch in. And, and, of course, we rely on results from many of the scientists who are actually not with us anymore. And uh, I think about all of those scientists who work so diligently for years and years like we did. And, uh, of course, uh, we don't know their name. And it just happened that we became known, but we think about them as well. Yeah, I feel like so many people are contributing to this puzzle and so many people put some of those pieces together that that really help the work to go. Dr. Weissman, with prizes like the the Ross Prize, how important is that for young scientists to be able to get that support and that funding to keep going with their work? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's unbelievably critical. I, I was doing some research and I went back and looked at when Katie and I started working together and when we first got funding to work together. And and there was about a 10 year difference in that. So the importance of giving young people, mid-level people funding to do new ideas, which which the Ross Prize does, is unbelievably critical. Dr. Weissman, tell me how you met Dr. Carreco. And from what I understand, it was was over a, a really slow, broke down photocopy machine that brought you guys together in the fall of 1997. Yes, so I had moved from the NIH to the University of Pennsylvania to set up my own lab. And back in those days, the only way you could read a journal article, a manuscript, was to photocopy the hard journal. Uh, So Katie and I both read a lot, and we would always be waiting for each other to finish photocopying. Uh, For for a while, I thought we were the only two people on the floor because we were always fighting over the photocopy machine. But we started talking, and Katie told me about her interest in RNA, and I told her about my interest in making vaccines, and we started working together. It was another 10 years before we actually made a vaccine, but in the meantime, we, we learned a lot about RNA. Can you tell us in the in the most simplest form, what is mRNA technology? So mRNA is, we did not invent it with uh, Drew Weissman. It was nature invented and every cell in our body has RNA, which is uh, carrying information from the DNA to the protein synthesis factory in our cells. And uh, this information, based on the information, the protein is produced and uh, then the RNA quickly degrades. So it is a transient information carrier Indeed. 
Yeah, you felt so strongly that this was going to work, but others really didn't buy into it. As a research assistant, in, um, a professor in Penn's medical school, you constantly pitched clinical researchers to use mRNA. How do you deal with rejection when they didn't want to go along with it? Usually, you know, that um, criticism, what I heard that too small amount of protein is produced too short period of time and it is not useful. So I try to improve the technology and uh, joining uh, forces together with uh, Drew, we did uh, a lot of study, especially when we realized that uh, the RNA is inflammatory. Then we try to understand why it is inflammatory, then try to come up with a solution, whether we can make it non-inflammatory so it could be widely used in human uh, uh, treatment and so and and as a scientist uh, we always face with a failure the experiments kind of seems not working and and we learned to come up with solutions that's our scientists is doing so if they criticize i listen and try to learn from it and improve what have you learned from each other over the years we taught each other each other's field of science so we weren't just two separate entities who relied on each other to do the other part of the work. We taught each other so we both knew both ends of the, of the street and we knew how to do what each other did. I, th I think I also, and I think I suspect each other, we've taught each other perseverance and diligence uh, because we had each other to rely on. We would often email at three in the morning with new ideas and new approaches. So, you know, I, I think there there was a lot that we've taught each other. Was your relationship helpful in all this to be able to bounce ideas off each other and to and to do that to call each other up or text each other in the middle of the night? Yes, of course. And usually, Drew told me that when I said, "Oh, I have a good idea" or something, and he said, "Oh, probably it was already done." <laughs> That's what he used to say. <laughs> I, I, I think our interaction is, is what made this project work. Uh, without that, you know, without each other's knowledge, th this wouldn't have been done when we did it. It, it might have been done five or ten years later, uh, but I, th I think our interaction really propelled this field. Yeah, what, was, it, was it her persistence that helped kind of convince you that this was the right direction? No, it, it was more just understanding the potential that RNA had. Um, th there had been many failed clinical trials which made pharmaceuticals and biotechs not interested in RNA. But th that was because the RNA they were using was inflammatory, it wasn't very good. And I think we both realized that if we could improve that, if we could make it non-inflammatory and have it produce more protein, it could be an, a, a great therapeutic. So we just kept pushing on. Yeah. And thankfully it did because this helped us to, to, to come up with a vaccine for COVID. There's so many trials underway now studying the use of mRNA for diseases other than COVID-19. Some look at the use of mRNA not as a vaccine, but like, as you said, a therapeutic. Can you tell us about the potential there? Is this a game changer in your mind for, for other diseases like cancer and, and other things? No, definitely. I mean, I, I think it, it's a game changer for vaccines. I mean, we had five phase one clinical trials started before COVID ever hit. So we and Moderna and BioNTech and other companies were already developing RNA therapeutics. But even in, in the meantime, now that the world knows about RNA, there's many other therapeutics being developed. Some of the newer things that, that are appearing now are targeting the lipid nanoparticles to specific cell types. So a few months ago, we made CAR T cells in vivo to treat fibrosis, cardiac fibrosis. And, and that has huge potential because it cost almost half a million dollars to do a CAR T cell treatment. And that's per treatment. With mRNA, it'll probably be thousands of dollars. We can target bone marrow stem cells. So we hope to be able to cure sickle cell anemia with a single IV injection of RNA LNPs, which again is a, is a game changer. One important thing about our technology that it makes uh, more affordable for the people. And we already heard uh, that Intelia also last year started another trial where they want to 
and they successfully could uh, interrupt the gene which was uh, toxic, making a toxic protein in patient who had amyloidosis. And uh, it seems that uh, the RNA will fulfill the promise of gene therapy as well. Yeah. How important is it now that we're, we're you know, the, the world is knowing about this and more people are starting to get involved. And thankfully, so many people became involved in the clinical trials for these vaccines before they were approved. How important is it to be enrolling people in clinical trials to test these things? No, I mean, that, that's absolutely critical. Um, and early on in the clinical trials, the phase three trials, they were primarily academic universities. And the FDA signaled that there was a problem early on because they were mainly enrolling young white men. And when you're making a vaccine for the world, that's unacceptable. Um, so th th that alerted the world. And many outside groups, including Feinstein, came in and said, look, we have to bring in women. We have to bring in minorities. We have to make this representative of the entire world. So it, it, it's absolutely critical. The response to COVID-19 brought the world together and showed the power of international collaboration. Dr. Weissman, can you talk about the value of working with colleagues from other countries? So I, I've been working with colleagues around the world for 30 plus years. Um, I, I think what's important is in an emergency situation like this, you need the input of many different scientists. Every scientist has their own expertise. Mm -hmm. So by collaborating, by talking about data, by discussing data, it allows projects therapeutics to be developed much quicker. Um, well, we've taken it a little further. We've also helped to develop RNA production sites throughout the world. So local countries, local groups, governments can now make their own RNA vaccines, which is critical for equity. Yep. So uh, we always like to end here on a 20 minute health talk on a positive note. Dr. Weissman, what gives you hope? What gives you optimism going forward? So the, the, there's a lot of things. So the, the optimism, for, for the most optimistic thing for me is that many young people are interested in science now and interested in going into careers in science. A lot of them for RNA, a lot of them for many other diseases. To, to me, that's the, that has the greatest amount of optimism because we need more people, young people, going into science, becoming researchers, developing new therapies and new treatments. So that, I'm, I'm incredibly excited by that. Dr. Kareko, Karika, how does that make you feel that, 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 that science is maybe becoming more popular now? Yes, so, so it is important, uh, the prize this way also, that uh, bring attention to the science and... Um, and bring attention for for those who want to be scientists to uh, learn more about the, uh, what a scientist can do. And um, and uh, considering myself, I will use most of the money I get for award is for research. And so that way it goes back to to the science again. The impact of Dr. Weissman and Dr. Carrico's research continues to be seen with each new COVID vaccine powered by the mRNA technology they championed and helped to advance. Next, we speak with Dr. Kevin Tracy, president of the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research, which established the Ross Prize in conjunction with the open access journal, Molecular Medicine. We spoke with Dr. Tracy to learn more about the intent of the Ross Prize and modeling open scientific exchange. Dr. Tracy, tell us a little bit more about the Ross Prize. The Ross Prize honors individuals who have made major commitments in basic science that was converted into therapies or cures. There's a, there's a, there's a general idea out there that, that, that cures come about either by accident or as a result of moonshot projects in government or pharma, but that, that's really not how they happen. The, the, way, the way cures come about is because an individual person or teams of people decide that there's a problem. They, have, they, experience, they experience the disease either personally or through a family member or friend, often when they're very young, and they decide that this problem needs to be solved, and they commit their life to it. And this story repeats throughout the history of medicine. 
over and over and over again. The Ross Prize identifies people who succeed in that area. They, they commit their, their lifetime work to the process of discovery in the hopes of producing a cure. It's a very unique um, niche. Um, it's, it's, uh, and, but of course, I, I can think of no more important space in which people should be rewarded and honored. So the Ross, the Ross Prize fills a very important niche in this space, identifying people who commit their life's work to making cures. Yeah, and I think also, too, philanthropy is so important in science because there's just not enough government support. Without philanthropy in the history of, of medicine and science, without philanthropy, there's no progress. Um, when, you know, one of my favorite definitions of, of research is Albert Einstein's. Albert Einstein said, if we knew what it was we were doing, it wouldn't be called research, would it? And so, so the point is, it's risky. You're, you're starting projects for which you don't know if they will succeed and they will likely fail. It's not a profit motive and philanthropy fills that void. Government can also fill that void. And we saw that with COVID. There was a national security need and there was the profit margins were not understood and they were not inevitable. Uh, and there wasn't or isn't enough money in philanthropy to launch what the what the government, not only the U.S. government, but other governments did. And so um, those are those in the history again, in the history of science and medical progress, it, it, it starts with either philanthropy or or government support to get the process started. Yeah, and we, it's, it's so interesting when we talk about mRNA technology is that so many people when COVID came out never heard of it and everybody thought it was this new thing, but this wasn't. This was something that scientists were working on and trying to perfect for so long. And now we're seeing so many benefits of how, besides COVID, that can have so many other uses. Exactly. I mean, this year's Ross Prize winners have spent decades working on this. And in their early years, much of their work was, was either ridiculed or discounted or even laughed at. And they persisted anyways. And they didn't persist because they knew the answer. They persisted because they understood that nobody knew the answer. And there's a huge difference there. Uh, if you understand that nobody knows the answer, then you can frame new questions. And, and the process of framing those questions and doing the work, you could arguably save, perhaps save the world because of, because of the two of them. And, and then and others, you know, they built, they built enormous teams and enormous labs of collaborators and colleagues. They're, these are two very humble individuals, and they would be the first to say that they didn't do this alone. But their leadership at a critical early stage and their persistence for decades is irreplaceable and deserves not only the Ross Prize, in my opinion, but many other honors and awards, which I think they're destined to win. Yeah. When we talk about this prize, it's, it's amazing. Tell us a little bit about how people can get involved with the Ross Prize, how they can nominate candidates maybe for 2023. The nomination process for the Ross Prize comes from university professors, deans, and colleagues of scientists who nominate candidates to be considered for the, the next year's prize. The We're accepting nominations now, and uh, self-nominations are not encouraged, <laughs> but we do encourage nominations by peers, colleagues, and uh, university leaderships. The Ross Prize is made possible by the generosity of the Feinstein Institute board members, Robin and Jack Ross, and includes a $50,000 award for each recipient. What can you say about um, Jack and Robin Ross and, and their commitment to, to science and research? Jack and Robin are tireless, enthusiastic visionaries. They have been, the two of them, the wind beneath the wings of the Feinstein Institutes from its earliest days. They have been generous benefactors, but they've also been tireless workers who have pursued the best interests of the Feinstein Institute, as I said, from the time it was founded. How much of an impact is it for researchers to, to be able to be rewarded with this, to be able to have this backing and this support? In, in the history of medicine and science, people who start to win prizes tend to win more prizes. And if the goal of the Ross Prize is to celebrate excellence and to celebrate progress and to generate new stories, I think the ripple effect on the individuals can be very significant. Nominations for the 2023 Ross Prize are now being accepted. Listeners can find a link in the show description to learn more. 
Thank you to our guests today, Dr. Caitlin Carrico, Dr. Drew Weissman, and Dr. Kevin Tracy. And to you, the listener, thanks for tuning in. I'm Rob Hoyle. Have a great day and stay safe.